Uh, good evening, everyone. On this onset, I would like to thank AOS for giving me this opportunity. Today, I'm going to talk about dry eyes post-refractive surgery. Now, dry eyes post-refractive surgery has become more of a short-term uh, temporary phenomenon, which even patients don't actually uh, feel it most of the time because we have all of us have been you know being uh, you know doing very meticulous screening and uh, treatment before we choose the patient for the surgery but if you look at all the side effects of the refractive surgery definitely dry eyes is one of the most common ones now when we look at the pathology uh, post refractive there is damage to the subbasal or subepithelial corneal nerves uh, there can be damage to the goggle cells or alteration in the corneal uh, curvature and this leads to decreased sensitivity and uh, unstable tear film and leads to DD. Now, there are many complications of dry eyes post-refractive uh, surgery, but uh, there are different risk factors also. So let's go over one of them. Uh, now, when we look at, uh, like, uh, you know, like the previous speaker also mentioned that age is one of the factors. As we become older, the cornea sensitivity reduces, there's a more risk of uh, dry eyes. And also it is more common in females. Now, when we look at the different kinds of surgery, uh, uh, it has been established that dry eyes is more common in LASIK compared to the rest of the surgeries, and uh, several studies have stated the same. Now, why is that so? Whenever we do a LASIK or create a flap, there's total disruption of the corneal nerves uh, when the flap making is done. Almost 90% has decreased corneal uh, nerve fibers uh, density. And uh, when we look at the smile, uh, there is, uh, it's more of a minimal invasive and uh, you, you know, the corneal subbasal uh, nerve plexus to a greater extent is preserved. Now, when we actually visualize the, uh, the corneal nerves, there is decrease uh, in uh, sub-basal uh, nerve density, uh, lesser in smile compared to FS LASIK. Now, this is the imaging of uh, the eye at uh, one month, uh, three months, and six months. As you can see, one month and three months, it is significantly lesser in smile compared to, I mean, sorry, in LASIK compared to smile. Now, uh, now, when we look at the positioning of the hinge, if you have a superior hinge, you cut both the uh, three o'clock and nine o'clock uh, neuroplexus. Uh, thus, you know, there are more chance of uh, dry eyes for surgery. But if you do it uh, nasally or temporarily, you save one of the arms. So that way, uh, it's the cornea is a little more sensitive. Now, if you have a larger hinge, definitely you save more uh, nerves and lesser dry eyes. Now, in trans-PRK, there is a significant decrease in corneal sensation, but uh, there is a faster recovery and rapid corneal nerve regeneration post-surgery. Now, fake IOL implantation is uh, one of the least uh, chances of uh, dry eyes post-refractive uh, surgery. And uh, when we uh, look at the amount of refractive power being corrected, obviously, more you ablate, you damage more nerves, and there are more chances of dry eyes. Now, uh, Preoperatively, make sure you take a detailed examination, OSDI, uh, do a thorough slant examination, do a corneal uh, topography, and look at the membrane glands, definitely. And the last three things, uh, if at all it is there in the institute, we can use it, where we have, you know, in vivo, uh, in vivo or confocal microscopy, you use uh, a vitamin D, and also uh, look for uh, inflammatory markers. So once you have identified, uh, screened it, then you can grade it, uh, I mean, put it into different categories like so and uh, treat it uh, like this. But uh, to keep it very simple, let's say if they have uh, mild dry eyes, uh, you can start uh, low potent steroids, uh, some uh, lubricants and also cyclosporin. And uh, if at all patient has MGD or uh, vitamin D deficiency, you just add it to it. Now, when we have moderate dry eyes, uh, we use more high potent uh, steroids. And uh, uh, depending on what the problem has, that also should be added. And we can also add lippy flow or uh, eye light or eye, uh, EI for the patient. So once you have done this, you see at four, four to six weeks and then reassess whether you can go ahead. Now, when we look at uh, lippy flow, basically it uh, heat massages the lid, uh, lid and brings, it, uh, brings up the temperature to uh, 42.5 degrees. And uh, so we did a study where we looked at two groups where we did preoperative lippy flow and uh, postoperatively, I mean, uh, one group without lippy flow. And we found uh, the OSDI, uh, you know, uh, beautifully, it is, uh, you can easily differentiate between the two arms where uh, pre uh, lippy flow, uh, the OS, uh, OSDI is much lower as compared to uh, without lippy flow. And also, when you look at, we, we looked at uh, the markers, there is uh, increased anti. Uh, not not uh, factors and decreased pro-inflammatory factors uh, in patients who went uh, pre-op lipid flow. 
Now you can also do uh, I, EI or uh, eyelight. So basically this stimulates the mevumin gland secretions. And uh, we usually do these kind of procedures if patients already has a lot of acne and dry eyes together. So that time these, these patients do really well in this particular treatment. Uh, I won't go to the post-operative dry eye treatment. I think it's kind of similar to what uh, pre-operative is. Let's go over a few cases. Uh, case one, here's a, a smile patient post-op uh, four months uh, where complaints uh, came with us with burning of sensation in the eyes and had 6 6 vision in both eyes. So we did a detailed examination of the patient uh, and uh, this is how the, res uh, the test results were look like. Uh, the tear breaker time was less, the OSDI was high, but the patient had uh, a deficiency of vitamin D and borderline hemoglobin. So we put the patient on uh, treatment and the uh, patient uh, did beautifully, beautifully well. Now, this is one more case where the patient had uh, a LASIK six months back, had 6-6 six, six parts vision uh, and uh, complaints of burning sensation, dry eyes and fog body sensation. So when we looked at uh, the eye, we found the presence of a few cap glands. The patient had MGD and uh, we put the patient on uh, a treatment, but actually uh, still the patient didn't have improvement. So we added the lipid flow to it and the patient beautifully improved and the patient had very nice uh, low OSI. So this is the last case uh, where we have a LASIK patient who a 22 year old uh, female patient who came to us who had 6-6 vision with minus two uh, power. And uh, on, uh, on examination, there was uh, epithelial uh, regularity. So we did a certain other tests and this is how uh, the patient looked like. And the patient also had vitamin D deficiency. Now, this was the preoperative, uh, 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 how the preoperative cornea looked like and postoperatively, uh, sorry, uh, preoperatively, when we look at the confocal, you can see the immature dendritic cells in the eye. And once we did uh, LASIK in this patient, the patient had very abnormal wound healing. There was epithelial hyperplasia and so on and so forth. And the patient's vision wasn't that great. So whenever you do, do see a lot of epithelial irregularities, please put the patient on treatment uh, and at four, four to six weeks, reassess and then go ahead with the treatment. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Naren. Uh, uh, Dr. Chitra. Yeah, actually, uh, Naren, you talked of uh, different aspects of uh, dry eye, but there's one other interesting thing which you also need to remember in refractive surgery, that the regression which is seen is more uh, noticed in dry eye patients. And, you know, it has been interestingly attributed to a release of an epidermal growth factor, which uh, causes epithelial hyperplasia and one cause of uh, regression. And the other thing it seems is because in a dry eye, there's release of inflammatory, cytokine, inflammatory cytokines and that causes apoptosis of cells and that causes an altered anterior stromal remodeling. So these things are happening in the dry eye patients and that is why there is more regression likely. So one big message I got was like all the other discussions that in our post plastic patients or refractive surgery patients, we should really concentrate on ensuring that the dry eye status is very well treated because some of the other uh, unexpected uh, surprises come. I have two questions for you. One is if you have a patient of rheumatoid arthritis who has been, uh, has come to you and is very keen on undergoing a refractive surgery patient, would you treat him if his systemic condition is stable? Uh, what are your uh, thoughts? Ma'am, uh, normally, I, I personally believe that if I find anything out of the ordinary, I would I, I just simply go ahead with the fakie lens because uh, they they do extremely well. Uh, the results are 6-6 six, six bang on the next day. No issues with dry eyes. So if, if I find anything that is... Patients have very severe dry eyes or some other, you know, collagen mask. I mean, I, I don't simply why to take the risk, even though the risk uh, is low, but it is more than a regular patient. So I don't take the risk. I would definitely go with fakey pilots. Yeah, I, I do agree with your point, but uh, but we need not spread the message out that. Yes, I understand. I personally do that. But and the eye is quiet. And they, they can be uh, continued with that treatment and you could still uh, do a refractive surgery, apparently. The other thing is, what is the cutoff which all of us would look at to say that this eye has significant dry eye and we will not do refractive surgery of any form? Is there any uh, such cutoff? 
uh, the thing is, ma'am, if after treatment patients, uh, I, I, I believe that it's severe, anything severe or uh, neurologic, I, I just completely uh, don't do any treatment and they have to respond to the treatment. Once we come back, the patient Not comes severe. back, uh, uh, the, the mild or moderate. Yeah, mild or moderate, uh, when they come back, they're symptomatically better. They have absolutely no complaints. Their eye looks better. Uh, then I I'm definitely would go for it. Definitely. Yes. Martha, you um, have anything? Naren, yes. Uh, nice. Good to hear. Uh, it was a fantastic presentation. Uh, just uh, you are mentioning about uh, probably you are the only one institute. We are all proud that you have got all three modalities of treatment. Either it is LP flow or this side uh, highlight and one more treatment you are telling. See, uh, my question to you. Suppose the how many sitting lipid flow you have to do one. Suppose like as you showed in your protocol that of course patient with the dry eye you treat them for four to six weeks then you call them for refractive procedure. Suppose one patient come to you is a very VVIP patient been influenced with so much they want to get operated. Okay, today he has come after a couple of days he want to get a refractive surgery done. Will you go ahead with the lipid flow today and after a day or two, will you go ahead with the refractive treatment? Uh, so the thing is, if, if the patient doesn't have any dry eyes or patient's perfectly normal, nothing is required. We can just simply go ahead. And if the patient, patient is having a dry eye, of a if, around if, if the patient has dry eyes, I think the problem always happens with the VIP. Sir. So never, the thing is we skip protocols, uh, just that we have to make sure that they follow the same line, same protocol. And the results will be always banged on. The thing is, whenever VIP comes, we skip a few steps, and that's where the mistake happens. <laughs> Do you really put this cyclosporine eye drops? If you have already treated the patient for four to six weeks, then you have done all the preoperative workup, your post op results also good. Post operatively, after tapering the steroid, will you put them once again back them with the cyclosporines? Yeah, yes, sir, definitely. Usually cyclosporins for a, quite some, uh, for quite a long time because it has, it has a very slow action. By the time it becomes uh, effective, so it takes a month or so. So we continue for a few months. Uh, so by the time the surgery also is done, after surgery, we just continue. That is, we are talking about if the patient already has some amount of dry eyes preoperative. Postoperatively, I mean, regular eyes, we don't use cyclosporin as a protocol. But if they have, then uh, preoperatively we start and it goes on postoperatively for a few months. Thank you. So a very specific yeah, question uh, that in here uh, yes. is, uh, you know, even after three months or six months, patients still complaining, complaining, complaining. When will you stay stop to cyclosporine? When when do you say stop to cyclosporine? Uh, uh, yes, sir. So so it's not uh, actually, working. Basically, it's not working. Yes, sir. So uh, we, uh, the, what normally we do is, sir, let's say if you have not done, uh, usually this lipid flow works really well in uh, such patients who don't respond even after, let's say, uh, six months or so. I, I, I don't know if I mentioned in the, the slide, but uh, once we do that, actually it's shown extremely promising because what happens is even we tell uh, hot compression and mid massage one is the patient is continuously pressing on the eye so that actually it's not good for the eye the uh, the lid massage so this is something that actually massages only the lid and doesn't put pressure on the eye so and it, and, it, and one treatment uh, lasts for quite some time it's like months together let's say about even 6 to 7 months one treatment is more than enough and patients extremely extremely happy and in fact, they just simply come, even if they don't have symptoms, we have had patients who just come after six to seven months. Okay, I just want it. And do you have any symptoms? No. <laughs> but so they really also, like the massage. Yeah, I also feel there is a neuropathic component to this dry eye in some of these patients that Partha was alluding to. So they that pain and discomfort has to be attributed to dry eyes. And sometimes these patients may not have been very compliant with their medications. So you have to spend that time to counsel them put them on to the higher end uh, artificial tears, which has sodium halonate and polyethylene glycol and those medications and cyclosporin. You could even go on with it for six months to one year, and I'm sure they would largely settle down. A right. small, uh, quick comment. Uh, uh, regarding rheumatoid arthritis, so I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, mm -hmm. Most often we find rheumatoid arthritis patients uh, may not have low shimmers. Uh, um, 
uh, or because but the issue with this is it's a progressive kind of a disease we don't know at what stage it is or whether it's on the borderline or not so like dr chitra was mentioning i think uh, the message should be set right that these patients have mechanisms that we may not completely understand which are causing dryness so doing any intervention in the form of uh, anything which compromises the corneal nerves or their stability i think or uh, the reflex secretion for that matter should not be done so i think for all cases which have any other autoimmune etiology which can work on the lacrimal gland secretion we should not be doing any um, refractive surgery and another quick point i've had a couple of my patients who uh come with issues of post refractive dry eye then we do their shimmers it's normal it's filling up this tears by 32 and then we just uh attribute it to either neuropathic pain or uh, uh that it is um, just uh, more of a psychological thing for the patient that they're very, very uh, sensitive towards these things but i've seen that a couple of them actually have a very short tear film break up time it could be as short as 3 seconds 2 seconds and we generally don't go that far if it's a normal shimmers we think it's okay it's not dry eyes but even with good tear production if it's evaporating faster their visual quality everything goes down and they may then get actually get into the loop of depression because here mm-hmm. they have gone in and electively got a surgery done when they were 20 20 with glasses so i think it's a very important thing treat their mgd really well and then i've seen most of the most of the patients were much more comfortable so i think tear film break up time should also be something very importantly evaluated in all these patients who come with post refractive dry eye ma'am if i can make one more yeah. point yes yes i can sir yes yeah, so yeah. i think uh, like rightly madam said um, i mean see one thing is very clear that we don't have to have a liquid flow even if you don't have it make sure you get the forceps you get these forceps which you can actually massage the eyelids so you just dip it in uh, some hot uh, you know uh, really sterile hot water and uh, make it warm and then you do the lid massage uh, that should be good enough i mean it's not as effective as the lippy flow but it it's 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 like a you know um, just a cost i mean just one instrument you can use it for many patients sterilize it and use it so i feel this is something that we need to do i mean i, I personally do for all mgd patients uh, if they can't afford or uh, they can't uh, Uh, you know that particular treatment because it's it is an expensive treatment so if they can't afford i just simply uh, you know as a protocol i just tell them okay this is what you do you do hot compression and so on and so forth but we will do a little ma- ma- lid massage for you so that we bring out all the secretions because if that initial thick secretions is removed out it is easier for the membrane glands to breathe so yes, sir. so uh, so last uh, comment sir uh, from uh, patal sir So, yeah, Parna, uh, I'll just uh, wish to add on. This is what uh, uh, we learned from uh, uh, our uh, beloved Professor Madan Mohan. Uh, even at that particular time, he would uh, do a lid spatula, put a lid spatula, put some xylocaine, and we would uh, do a, a, a firm massage to uh, express out the secretion. That is very very important. And then betadine uh, would be used for the at the edges of the lids, which is there. Even uh, today i got a patient from one of my uh, uh, fellow colleagues uh, who's uh, done two or three retina surgeries in the patient the patient was very very unhappy and he said ke bhai maine i have shown to one retina surgeon another retina surgeon three people i have said they have all said retina is settled everything is good this that as so has been done and when i looked at the lids they were like uh, it it was a very bad case of mgd so uh, they the there the the kind of emphasis that we are getting over the last few uh, years on dry eye and also because of the environmental uh, pollution and breaking of of the tears etc etc it has increased computer vision syndrome also it has increased but the other emphasis that we are getting today is on the mgd and mgd if you start looking i i am really surprised that when i start looking at these chronic patients most of them have mgd and a simple thing of warm compresses followed by lid massage followed by eye wipes etc and maybe a course of uh, uh, any tetracycline or doxycycline etc they definitely definitely help help these people and uh, i am getting great results i did not buy the uh, lippy flow because uh, it uh, is expensive and uh, the, as and uh, rain was saying a uh, warm compresses can help i have uh, rather uh, started doing a lot of these uh, ipl treatments and i think they are also giving great results and the patients are pretty pretty happy on that 
so i think dry eye has become something very very important in uh, our armamentarium it is something that we need to look at because it is a chronic discomfort kind of a situation that is there uh, which the patient has and the patient will blame it on the surgery the patient will not say ke bhai ye pehle se tha ya nahi tha because it just gets aggravated after surgery and the patient starts to notice and the patient is more concerned about symptoms within the eye etc so uh, even uh, uh even sorry and that is something very very important that we need to now carefully look at dry eye the only problem is that our systems are so made as was uh, being said whether it's a sop or not that by the time the patient reaches the counseling and the patient wants a trifocal lens or a premium lens everything is washed out you can't then you will have to call the patient again to do a dry eye workup so that's a slight logistic problem that is there because you can't say from before and what the patient will be doing and whether the patient is going for a cataract Uh, surgery etc but somehow or the other i think uh, uh, we are going to have happier patients if we diagnose and treat uh, even pre operatively and post operatively uh, 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 the uh, dry eye disease uh, dr patra Thank one uh, quick question i actually had for the panel if i may so uh, sometimes dry eye is missed and by chance a pre existing even if it's a milder form is missed and the patient actually has a multifocal or trifocal in one of the eyes and is unhappy what do we do with the other eye with the other uh, eye why you treat the dry eye status and sort the, all the issues and then to the other eye how is multifocal going to be against a dry eye uh, i the present multifocal uh, no so it there no, is a mutation uh, because if the ocular surface is not good the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, amount of uh, deterioration in the quality of vision like when you say that if there is a residual astigmatism in a trifocal lens or a multifocal lens the uh, the uh, dysphotopsia is disproportionately increase as also the deterioration yeah. in the quality so similarly if the ocular surface is bad that's going to hit a multifocal lens much much uh, uh, more yeah. than it is going to hit a uh, monofocal or an eye hands today so that is why it is important uh, I, I do... also in the toricity because in the toric lenses a with the amount of toricity that is there can be incorrectly uh, diagnosed by the uh, by the iol master or the lens star or whatever it is and post operatively also the ocular surface is not going to give you a good uh, a good uh, outcome so premium iols yes uh, uh, dry eye is going to be much much more uh, uh, imperative for us to treat them uh, rather than in monofocal lenses most often they come very unhappy with that eye so what solution do we offer to them uh, for the other eye because they're seeking for some solution so they're kind of in a trap uh, like for dry eye the only thing is that it becomes a odd situation where you have put a multifocal and then you turn around and tell the patient that because you have a severe dry, dry eye which i missed diagnosing and i will not be able to do that but often i think nowadays Uh, uh with the newer modalities of treatment that we have and also with the cyclosporin etc the use of the drugs as also the ipl uh, lipiflo etc uh, we are uh, in a better position to get comfort to these patients and you have to tell them because normally i am uh, all refractive cases earlier but now in all cases of cataract uh, we are giving uh, uh, lubricant eye drops to all patients I've had couple of patients where RA was missed and they've undergone trifocals outside. Now they've been referred to LVP. So uh, uh, it's just such a fix that you don't know what to do. Ah, uh, I think let's go to refer them to CMS, right? <laughs> From LVP, you refer them to CMS. We will take care of them. <laughs> you can refer them to us too. We'll take care of them. <laughs>